really, really, really good to see everybody. I'm glad that you're here. For everybody tuning in online, so glad you're joining us online. Uh, first, let me apologize for if you tried to tune in last week online. We had a bit of an issue, some hiccups and a technical little uh, problem going on last week. The team has worked extremely hard fixing that, getting it back online today. I know it's working well, so hey to everybody online. We're all waving to, to all of you here. And let me just, I want to give a big shout out to a group of folks because, you know, the last 14 weeks, as Robert's mentioned, um, in some regards, I know a lot of, you know, work's been different, everything else. In terms of church and ministry and, and still being able to come uh, bring message and worship and everything to everybody online. I will tell you, doing this and doing this well online is way, way, way harder than doing it live and in person. It just is. There's so much more to it. And our media and tech and worship team have worked incredibly hard, crazy hours. In particular, I want to thank Pedro and Stephen and Caesar. They have worked so hard. And uh, thank you guys for all your time and energy and efforts. And uh, anyway, we just appreciate you. Well, I'm glad you guys are here. And we're going to continue a series I started last week called It Is Well. And um, here's what we talked about last week. The basic idea of this series we're going to be in uh, last week today and uh, finish it up next week is the idea simply that when the world around us is not well, Christ in you makes it well with you. That when you're a follower of Christ, when the world around us, when the world around you is chaotic and crazy and not going well, at the foundation of our faith is that Christ is in us. Christ is not just around us or near us, and we're not just around him and near him, but the gospel is that Jesus Christ dwells in you if you're a follower of him, and it is Christ in you that actually enables it to be well with you even when the world around you is not well. And so we talked about last week the fact that spiritually, how that is true, why that is true. Paul, in Romans chapter 8, um, and if you weren't here, didn't get a chance to watch it, you can go to our Facebook page and find that from last week. But the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 gives us the case of why he believed that, why he was convinced. He says, I am convinced, I know that neither death nor life nor angels or demons nor anything in creation can separate me from the love of God. I'm convinced of this, um, that w when everything around me is not going well, that God is still at work for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Paul was convinced of this, and yet Paul knew many, many things in his life that had not gone well. It showed you a statement of his own writing that says how many times he'd been shipwrecked and how many times he'd been uh, beaten with rods and whips and how many times he'd, dr he'd even drifted at sea you know, more than once, day and a night, without food or water. And it, so many things had not gone well, and yet he was still saying, I'm convinced it's well with me. And so last week we laid the foundation of why that is true, because when Christ is in us, God adopts us as his children, makes us his own, gives us his Holy Spirit to guarantee what is to come. What I want to do today is I want to move from talking about why we can have confidence that it is well spiritually. When we have that spiritual confidence, that also means when the world around us is not well, that it can be well with us mentally. I want to talk about this today. So if you have a Bible, Philippians chapter 4 is where I'm going to be. Um, we're going to be some other places too. All the verses will be on the screen. But Philippians chapter 4 is where we're going to start. Philippians is a letter written by the same guy we were reading from last week, Paul. And he's writing to a group of Christians in the city of Philippi, very important city. And here's what he has to say towards the end of that letter in, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5. He says, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone because the Lord is at hand. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Wouldn't it be great if we took this verse seriously these days, right? Can I get an amen on that one? I'll go old school on you, right? right? Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Now, why does it say that? Why does it say let your reasonableness be known to everyone? Here's why it says that. Because when you are angry, when you are anxious, when you are upset, when you are scared, the very first thing that goes out the window is reasonableness. Would you agree? I mean, think about that. If I'm angry, if I'm scared, if I'm anxious, if I'm upset, the first thing that goes out the window is that I'm willing to be reasonable. My daughter works uh, for Chick-fil-A here in town and when she's home from college. And she, she works, she's been working uh, you know, since she's been back for actually many weeks now, um, not being at school. And just about every day that she works, not every single day, but many days that she works, she likes to come home and she'll tell me about whatever crazy person she saw that has caused her to question humanity that day, right? At least her faith in humanity. Somebody's going to lose their mind over a chicken sandwich. It happens all the time. And, and inevitably, right now, what's happening is that somebody, a customer, because their dining room is still closed, a customer will walk in the store, and some um, a team member, right, will have to walk up, and I'm sorry, but, you know, our, our dining room's actually closed. You have to order, you know, through the app or go through the drive-thru. 
And almost every time you do that, inevitably it's some guy that walks in and they're going to walk in the door to make his order and some 17-year-old girl is the one that has to, is the first one there, I'm sorry, we're closed. And the guy loses his mind because the dining room is still closed and chews the 17-year-old out, yelling at her, complaining to her, chewing her out about how bad that is and why they should open and everything else. Because after all, it is the 17-year-old's fault, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's her decision to open or not open the dining room right? it, 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 every single day. People just lose their mind. But here's what I told my daughter the other day. I was like, honey, you do realize that person being angry at that, that young lady really has nothing to do with that young lady, and it really has nothing to do with the fact that the dining room is not open. It's that they are angry or anxious or upset about everything else, and you're just the one or that person's the one that gets the brunt of it that day because it just put them over the edge, and they're going to let their reasonableness Go out the window and take all the pain and all the confusion and all the frustration about everything that's going on out on that poor, unsuspecting 17-year-old, right? I mean, because when we're angry, anxious, upset, or scared, reasonableness goes out the window. How many of you that are married have experienced reasonableness going out the window? Well, that got quiet. I figured I would get a little bit of something, right? You don't have to elbow your spouse or whatever else, right? But you know, I know... That at some point when you're having, as I like to call them, one of those energized marital conversations, at some point one person looked at the other and said, would you just be reasonable? Oh, see, I'm not the only one. Okay, that makes me feel a lot better. Why? Because when we're angry, anxious, scared, upset, reasonableness goes out the window. Here's what Paul goes on to say. Let your reasonableness be known to all, and here's how you do that. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And check this out. You got, many of you know this verse. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard two things. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul makes the case that when the world around us is not going well, we need the peace of God to not only guard our heart, but we need the peace of God to guard our minds. We need the peace of God to guard our minds. Why? Because every decision you've ever made, every good decision you've ever made, every dumb decision you've ever, ma ever made, every temptation you've ever said yes to, every temptation to sin you've ever said no to, it all started as a thought in your mind. You need God to guard with his peace your mind. We all do. And here's why I think this is so incredibly important. And certainly not only for the season that we're living in, but always. Here's why it's important. It's important because when you look at the world around us, when things are or are not going well, have you ever noticed how some voices are louder than others? Some things you just hear more clearly than others? Why is that? Why is it that there's some statements or there's some ideas or there's some narratives that just everybody seems to hold on to and cling to and be familiar with more than others? Here's one of the reasons I think it is. I think it's because, then, because what is spoken the loudest, we tend to hear the most. Whatever is being spoken loudest, we tend to hear most. We tend to hear the clearest. We tend to hear the most clear. We tend to hear the most consistently. Whatever is being spoken loudly, whatever that might be, whether it's true or not, right or wrong, whatever is being spoken loud is what we hear the most. And the danger with that is that whatever it, what's being spoken most loudly that we hear the most, the danger is that sometimes when we begin to hear that, especially when it when what we hear loudly does one of two things, when it feeds into my fears or when it, when it um, says what I want to hear, what, what, what is spoken most loudly tends to be followed. Whatever is being spoken loudly is what I tend to hear most. And whatever is loudly spoken not only tends to be heard most, it also tends to be followed, especially when it feeds into my fears or says what, what I want to hear. Because... It, you think about this, and this, you see this happening all the time right now. You see one, one news broadcast, oh, I, I knew it. Whether it's true or not, whether it's right or, or wrong, if it's feeding into what I fear, man, not only am I going to hear it, but I'm going to follow it immediately, especially if it says what I want to hear. We're looking to be affirmed. We're looking for our opinions to be affirmed. We're looking for our fears to actually be validated. I should be afraid of this. I should be scared of that. This is how we should handle this. This is how we should not handle this. And the moment you find anything that's being said, that feeds into your fears or says what you want to hear, you're going to be tempted to follow it, whether or not it's right or wrong, especially when it's being spoken loudly. But the scripture says, hey, before you go following anything, do this. Let your reasonableness be known to all and let the peace of Christ guard your minds. And so what I want to talk about today is how do we make sure 
that the peace of God is guarding our minds so that, as Paul says, our reasonableness can be known to all. Not our emotions, not our passions, but our reasonableness can be known as followers of Christ. Where do we begin with that? The Apostle Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 12. Very well-known verse. I'm sure many of you have heard a time or two before. Do not be conformed to this world, he says, but be transformed. How? By the renewal of your mind. Because when your mind is renewed, he says, you will be able to test and discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul says, when, when you step out into the world and you're looking at everything going on around you and with you and near you, and it doesn't make sense, and when the world around you is not all that well, and you begin to hear all kinds of loud narratives and voices and statements and ideas being screamed from the rooftop, the tendency is going to be for you to listen to whatever's being spoken loudly, and whatever's being spoken loudly, you're going to be tempted to follow, especially when it feeds into your fears and says what you want to hear. But Paul says, before you do any of that, why don't you do this? Make sure that you're not being conformed to the world. Be transformed. How? By letting God renew your mind so that you can actually test and discern what is good and acceptable and perfect. How do you do that? What is he saying? Renew your mind. So I want to talk for a few minutes about this idea of renewing your mind. What does it mean? Because it's not really an easy thing to do. And it's really kind of a vague thing, if we're really honest with each other, right? Renew your mind. Okay, that's great. I mean, I can renew my membership to the gym and still not go, and I can renew it every year and still not go and still have a membership to the gym, right? I can renew my membership. I can renew a warranty on a car. How do you renew your mind to the point you're able to actually discern by testing what is good and acceptable and perfect according to the will of God? How do you do that? Well, back in Philippians 4, Paul gives us a starting point. Look at Philippians 4, verse 8. He says, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything that is excellent, anything that's worthy of praise, think about these things. In other words, Paul's making the case that you and I have the ability to decide and to determine what it is our mind is going to dwell on, what it is our mind is going to think about, what our mind is going to consume and obsess over. And Paul said, if your mind is going to obsess over anything, how about this? Start by trying to get your mind to obsess over whatever is true, that your mind would obsess over whatever is honorable. Remember I was talking about this recently, giving thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all? Right? Obsessing over what's honorable, obsessed over what's just, which means sometimes, yes, you got to stand up for what's right and kind of push back against what is wrong, but be obsessive over what is just. Be obsessive over what is pure. Obsess over what is lovely and commendable and excellent and, and, and worthy of praise. Now, I, I've told this story before. I think it's been a long time since I've told this story, but when I was a kid, especially when I was a teenager, my mom loved this verse. And what she really loved was to recite this verse to me on a Friday night as a teenager, just as I was leaving to go hang out with my friends for the evening, right? And what she loved to say is I was walking out the door, you know, what time are you going to be home? And we'd say, okay, be careful. And right as I walked out the door, she'd say, now remember, Philippians 4 ate it. Yes, mom. All right. I mean, just all the time. Philippians 4, 8. Sometimes she would say the verse, right? Whatever's true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. Think about those things tonight. When you're tempted to make a dumb decision, Philippians 4, 8 it. You're taking that girl out tonight, Philippians 4, 8 it, right? Or whatever it was, Philippians 4, 8. I mean, it got to the point where when she would just say, and remember, I know, Philippians 4, 8 it, Mom. Okay, good night. I'll see you later, right? I mean, I just, and so, you know, you know those cartoons where you've got like the angel and the devil, you know, your two consciences speaking into your ear? For me, it was just my mom. Philippians 4, 8. Philippians 4, 8. And I, I've had this verse memorized since I was a kid. But here's the thing. I, I will be honest with you. To a degree, it worked. I wish I could say it worked 100%. Sorry, Mom, if you're watching. It didn't work 100% of the time. But it did work because I actually, there were moments I can still think about. I could play back in my mind where it was like, oh, I could just hear my mom saying Philippians 4 8. Okay, you know, maybe, may, maybe not. But what is that about? It's about training us where our minds go. Now, why is this so important? That we would actually, again, I want you to think of this as training. I've got to discipline myself 
to obsess over what is pure and honorable. Why? Because human nature is to obsess over what is impure and unhonorable. <laughs> I mean, our human nature, the sinful nature, is opposite of every one of these things. Paul says, train yourself, discipline yourself to change the way you think, to renew the way you think by thinking on these things. Why is it so important? Back in Romans chapter 7, he makes this argument. Here's one of the reasons why. Paul says, For I delight in God's law, but I also see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. Paul's argument, in fact, this is that passage where you might remember he talks about how the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing. And why, why do, oh, wretched man that I am, why do I keep doing the things I don't want to do and not doing the things I want to do? His basis for that, his realization, his argument is here's why that happens. Because even though God's law is at work in me and the word of God as a follower of Christ is at work transforming and changing and saving me, there's another law still at work in my life. It's the law of sin. And it's waging war against my mind. The law of sin, as a Christian, Paul says, is waging war against the way I think. And because it's waging war against the way I think, I've got to turn the tide and I've got to wage war back against the way my mind thinks. I've got to wage war against the law that's waging war uh, against me. I've got to take this seriously. I got, it's, it's much more than just, a, oh, let me you know, read a Bible verse here and there. Let me say a prayer here or there. Maybe even sing a Christian song here or there. Paul says, no, it is a war being waged against my mind. And why my mind? Because every conscious decision I've ever made, every unconscious decision I've ever made, every temptation I've overcome, every sin I've succumbed to, it all started in my mind, including my tendency to look at the world around me and the things that are not going well in the world around me. And to listen loudly to the things that feed into my fears. Or listen loudly to the things that are saying what I want to hear. To the point that I might even be following things that are not good for me. That are not true for me. That are not godly and right. Just because it's loud and it's what I'm afraid of and it's what I want to hear. Paul says, fight back against the, the law at work waging war against your mind. How? By deciding what you're going to think on. Think about the things that are honorable, worthy of praise, holy, and right. Now, my, my pastor growing up, Pastor Charles Rossell, he had a saying. Sometimes in the middle of a sermon, he'd stop and he'd say, he'd warn you. He'd say, all right, I'm about to go from preaching to meddling. And you know what that means, right? I'm going to meddle a little bit. That's what, that's what he meant by that. I'm getting ready to dig. I'm getting, getting ready to meddle. I'm going to probably step on some toes. I'm going to get all in your business, right? That's what he meant by that, going from preaching to meddling. Well, I'm going to borrow that phrase from him right now, and I'm going to go from preaching to meddling for just a minute, if that's all right. And if it's not all right, I'm going to do it anyway, all right? So, Because I have the microphone. I, I, I really am afraid right now that way more than filling our minds with what Paul was describing in Philippians 4, that you and I are filling our minds, so many of us are filling our minds right now, not with godly things, not with spiritually helpful things, not with honorable things, not with, with peaceful things. We're filling our minds with things that are feeding our fears and saying what we want to hear, and we're filling our minds with things like 24-hour news. And you know what's going to be on the news. There's only one of three things that's going to be on the news right now anyway. And we're filling our minds with news and we're watching everything it's saying about COVID and everything it's saying about race and it scares and it angers and it upsets us and everything it's saying about politics and it scares and it upsets us and, 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 and causes concern. All these things we're watching on the news and it's filling our minds. And if it's not the news, it's social media where everybody, every one of your friends on social media is a Google PhD, Right? And you know what all that is, right? All that means is that you spent five minutes searching something online, you found one article, you posted it, and now you've got a PhD in whatever that subject is, and everybody should take that as gospel truth. So everybody either has a Google PhD, or we're watching news, and it's filled with things that are feeding into our fears, or saying what we want to hear, and as a result, we find ourselves getting angry, anxious, upset, and scared. Am I, am I connecting with anybody here? Anybody see this happening in any place, shape, or form or out there? And the result... You know what the result I found is? The result is most people have stopped being reasonable about any of it. Why? Because we, are, we have filled our minds not with righteousness and truth, but with fear and anxiety and anger. The things that are 
feeding the things we're scared of and are saying what we want to hear. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying that as a Christian or as a church, you ought to bury your head in the sand and ignore the news and not engage in what's happening. I think you should. I think we all should. What I am saying is that as a follower of Jesus, that you and I have to first fill our minds with righteousness, fill our minds with godliness, fill our minds with peace peace and hope and things that are honorable and excellent and worthy of praise so that we have the right lens to filter through everything that the world is trying to fill our minds with. And some of what the the world is screaming really, really loud is true and right, and some of what the world's screaming really loud is wrong and not right at all. How do you know? How do you filter? How do you decide? Listen, it's not easy. It might be extremely complicated, but I know that as a follower of Christ, if I am first filling my minds with the righteousness of Christ, then the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding is going to guard my heart and my mind. And where does that start? It starts by deciding, what am I going to think about? What am I going to dwell on? What am I going to obsess about today? And what I really think is that some of us need to get up tomorrow morning and not turn on the news and get up tomorrow morning and not pick up our daggum phone. Instead, get up tomorrow morning, open the word of God, and fill our our, our lives with a little bit of hope and righteousness and peace before we open the rest of it up so that we can see right and hear right and process right and discern what the will of God is, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. And again, I'm not saying to ignore the world around us, and I'm not saying to bury our heads in the sand. I'm just saying, as a Christian, where are we starting? I'm afraid too many of us are starting the same place the world does. And then you wonder why Christians, as much as the world, are just as angry, are just as anxious, are just as upset, and are just as scared. When the fact is, if Christ is in me, when the world around me is not well, if Christ is in me, it's still well with me. We ought to be different. We ought to be different. And so here's the Bible's solution. Look at something Peter said. God spent an enormous amount of time with Jesus, one of the three closest people to Jesus. Peter says this, listen, prepare your minds for action. Isn't that an interesting statement? Prepare your minds for action. Don't be on the defensive, be on the offensive. Be prepared. How? By being sober-minded, By setting your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Prepare your minds. Be sober-minded. How? Set your mind on the hope of the grace of Jesus Christ. So I I, I want to give a couple practical challenges to us today. Because, you know, I've talked with people in the last few weeks, followers of Christ, deep followers, committed followers of Christ, overwhelmed, scared to death about the things that are going on. And and I get it on the one hand. But listen, (laughs) I'll meddle a little bit more for a second. If as a follower of Christ, you are, let me back up. If COVID-19 doesn't take your life, I'm guaranteeing you that something else will. And if your physical life on this earth ending fills you with fear as a Christian, friend, I want to suggest there's something about the gospel that you've missed. Because Paul said it this way, this guy that faced death on a regular basis, he goes, here's what I've been convinced of, that to live is Christ and to die is gain. Every further day I get to live on this earth is fantastic because I get to live in the glory of God for the purpose of Christ. I get to interact with my family and my friends and everybody else. I can't wait. I I hope it lasts longer. But the moment my life ends here and I'm with God, that's even better, right? To live as Christ, die as gain. And and I'm not saying leave this room, run out the door, and try your best to catch COVID-19. That's not what I'm saying either, okay? But from a follower of Christ standpoint, my hope, is that a virus would not create a panic in us in terms of our mortality, our future, and our eternity. 
Not because it's not dangerous and not because we shouldn't be responsible. It can be dangerous and we absolutely should be responsible. We're still being responsible as, as a church. But my hope is not in how many days I have on this earth. My hope is that God saved me through the work of Jesus. And I have given me his spirit in me, a guarantee of my inheritance that is to come. And I live with faith and hope and confidence in that. I'm going to meddle in one more category. If you're filled with anxiety about the outcome of what happened the first Tuesday in November, or second Tuesday, whatever that Tuesday is in November, listen, friends. Whoever is or is not residing and working out of that house on Pennsylvania Avenue is not your hope either. God rises kingdoms and he allows them to fall. He, every person who serves us in that way, the Bible says in Romans, is a servant of God sent to do good to those who do good and be God's agent of wrath on those who would do evil. They are his servants. God's absolutely in control. If you find yourself absolutely overwhelmed with fear about what might or might not happen in November, there is something about the sovereignty of God that you've missed as a follower of Christ. Again, does it mean you shouldn't be involved in politics? No, nope. man, I hope we have more and more godly men and women that would join that cause. But let our hope first be in the God who saved, redeemed, and has given us confidence for the future. So here's what I want to challenge all of us today. I want to challenge you to a, a new normal mentally. We're hearing this phrase, new normal, all the time, right? I want to challenge you to a new normal mentally. In the morning... When you wake up, before you roll over and grab that phone and scroll through social media to see what your favorite Google PhD friend has to say today. And as soon as you see that post that somebody made that just infuriates you and you're tempted to respond and you're ready to kind of lash out a little bit before you pick that, before you pick up the remote and turn on the news, before you turn to whatever your favorite channel is, whichever side that is on and we're look at what's going on in the world. What if you did this? What if we woke up tomorrow morning, rolled over, grabbed our phone, and opened our Bible app and read a couple of songs? We opened up our physical Bible, if anybody still has these. And we read through Proverbs. And you read something through the book of James. And you spent 15 minutes thinking about things that are honorable and excellent and worthy of praise first. I wonder if our lenses to filter what the world is filling our minds with would help us filter it through a little more clearly, that we could discern and test what, what is good and pleasing and perfect a little bit better. Before you fire back at that friend, Whatever ignorant comment they made in your opinion on, on social media, what if you said, you know what, give, let me give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And again, before we turned on the news and walked out the door, if we said, you know what, let me spend some time praying. God, today, let me see you at work around me. God, today, help me be a voice of honor and reasonableness. God, today, Help me to think on the things that are worthy of praise so that your peace would guard my heart and my mind today. Christ in you makes it well with you when the world around you is not well. And it starts by transforming the way that we think. Let me pray for us today. Father, God, I pray that your word would encourage us, would convict us, would change us, would shape us, that we would be men and women that are honorable in the sight of all, that our reasonableness would be known to everyone because in this world that oftentimes lacks reason, that is motivated by anger and fear, so much of the time, God, may our hope in you, our confidence in you, change the way that we think so much that it points people around us to you. God, help us to be men and women that do not ignore 
the, the questions and the fears and the, and the hate and the anger and the issues around us, that we would be men and women that step directly into them, but that we step into them with your grace and your truth and your righteousness surrounding us, giving us confidence, even as we use wisdom, giving us peace, even when we have concern. Because in the end, God, our eternity, our souls, our lives on this earth, and our souls forevermore reside with you. Thank you, God, for the hope we have in your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for being with us today. For everybody watching online, we miss you. We look forward to being gathered back together one of these days uh, soon. Keep tuning in online. Hope you join us next week as uh, Pastor Robert is going to be winding this series up for us next Sunday. For everybody here, again, thanks for being a part of our worship gathering this morning. Don't forget, next Sunday, as Robert mentioned, we only have one live um, opportunity at 9.30, and only at 9.30 next week are we going to have the opportunity for you to grab it and reserve a spot next week because of the 4th and other things going on. So go online tomorrow at 9 o'clock, reserve that spot, join us next week. We love you guys. Be blessed. Have a great day. Let's go live for Jesus today. God bless you.